Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fellowship. Charlotte Christian Fellowship, that well, is. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a great time this week. I uh, hope y'all did also. Yes. Uh, let us open up in prayer. Okay. Mr. David, would you like to leave this morning? Sure. Okay. Holy Father, <clears throat> we come before <throat> you once again this morning with thankfulness in our hearts for this beautiful new day that you have made. <clears throat> We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Thankful for your loving kindness and your tender mercies that you extend to us each and every day. Father God, I've come to realize that if I wake up in the morning and I've still got breath in my lungs, you've given me another chance to get this thing right. Amen. And that's true for all of us, Lord. Help us to be attentive to your calling, to your drawing. You're wooing us back mm -hmm. into a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. Father God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would touch the heart of those who are watching. That by what they hear, Lord God, there is a transformation that's going to take place. As Brother um, Zach Poonin teaches us all that Jesus taught, I pray that you would illuminate their minds to understand what the Spirit of God is saying to them at this hour. So I thank you, Lord God, for the privilege you give my husband and I to serve you and to disciple others. And we ask all of these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, this morning, I listened to my brother, uh, Charles Stanley, on, uh, on the TV, and he was studying uh, uh, the part about Jesus coming back. And it touched me real, uh, real deeply, because a lot of times you hear these people, um, so-called false prophets, who saying, well, uh, uh, when the Jesus is coming back and stuff of that nature. But uh, uh, even Jesus said, uh, and to his disciple who walked with him, when they asked him, he said, well, uh, this is not your business. And in, in a sense, he said, what y'all need to do is be pay attention to doing the work, you know? Mm -hmm. And then um, I think it was Matthew. It's, uh, let me see if I still have it up here. Uh, Matthew, uh, and wife, you read a lot better than I do, if you would, please. Uh, Matthew 24, mm -hmm. uh, from 42 to 51. Uh, I'll let y'all 24, you said? Matthew 24, mm -hmm. 42 mm -hmm. to 51. Uh, okay. And, and it's, it's good that when we talk and uh, have our fellowship that you have your word with you. You can have it in any form you want it, but have your word with you but you can follow along. It's important that you learn the word for yourself, uh, which is disciple you to Christ, but we use his words to point you to him. So uh, wait, please. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, I'm going to go... Uh, a little bit above that okay. because it's always good to have a context for the Amen. conversation mm -hmm. so you'll know what they were talking about. And this is when uh, Jesus was talking to his disciples about mm -hmm. the end days mm -hmm. and they had questions. They wanted to know and understand. And so this is, um, this is his response to them. And I'm going to start reading at verse 32. He says, now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud, its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene mm -hmm. until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Amen. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even mm -hmm. the angels in heaven. <laughs> Or the Son himself, only the Father knows. Mm -hmm. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and partying and weddings right up until the time <coughs> the Lord entered into his boat. Amen. People didn't realize what was going on, what was going to happen, until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other going to be left. Mm -hmm. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One's going to be taken, and the other one's going to be left. Mm -hmm. So you, you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Now understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, mm -hmm. he would keep watch mm -hmm. and not permit his house to be broken into. Mm -hmm. You also must be ready all the time mm. for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Mm. A faithful, sensible servant 
is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. Mm -hmm. If the master returns and finds the servant has done a good job, mm -hmm. there's going to be a reward. Mm -hmm. I tell you the truth. The master will put that servant in charge of all that he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks, well, my master won't be back for a while. And he begins to beat the other servants, partying and getting drunk, carrying on. The master will return unannounced and unexpected and will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's called hell, y'all. Mm. Brothers and sisters, uh, the Lord put that on my heart to bring it forth because a lot of us are pretending. The word hypocrite mm -hmm. means someone who's uh, perpetrating a fraud. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's put it in today's term because very few people will shred, you know, grinds and stuff like that. They were talking about the women doing back in the old days. But now he's simply saying that while you're at work, whatever you're doing, we're talking about today. See, he died for us, and when you read the scripture, you say well, he died for our past sins, present, and future. So he died for the disciples dead who talked to them, and those people, and if you read in Revelation, you'll find out also that, you know, before uh, even disciples, you had the Old Testament, okay? Those people who didn't receive the word of God, he talked to them too. So when he died in the grave, you'll find out whether, you know, the people, uh, uh, when he went to the grave, they had people walking around on earth. You see that he just kept, set the captives free. So you will find these things as you read and study the word. But what I'm getting to is this. We're to be at work. We're not to be faking it. And, and, and Lord knows your heart. So you might be able to fool your, your, even your wife or your children or the pastor in the church or the people around you at your job. But you can't fool God. That's right. See, that's, that's the thing. And see, this is a work that God has called us to do. Just like he's called us, we have a spiritual gift, but there's fruits of the spirit. Those are the things that people know you by, him by, by the fruits, you see, because that's his, that's his uh, uh, personality that, we, that, uh, that shows up in us. Uh, how Christ is, are we patient? Are we faithful to the word? Are we doing what we're saying? We're talking. Mm -hmm. And see, those things a lot of us fall short of. Even when we fall short, remember the word repent. When you find yourself out of order, don't tell somebody else to get in order. You ain't in order. We have... Uh, 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 been called. Paul says we are slaves. Okay, slaves to the word of God. That's what he was talking about them. He's talking about the, uh, when the master come back, when, you know, he sees the, uh, the person at work and, you know, not working or working because he said when he find the, uh, when he comes back and he finds the person at work and stuff, we, he's, he's talking about the slave who he hired. We're slaves of the word of God. So when he come back, are we doing the work that he told the slave to do? Or are we just thinking, well, well, since the master ain't here, I can do what I want to do. Since you don't think Jesus is real, then you're going to say, well, I can do what I want to do. And when, uh, you know, when Jesus come back, I can, you know, I'm saved. So, you know, I can go into the kingdom of heaven. That ain't so. No, it isn't. Because when, it's not. Let me say one more okay. thing. Mm -hmm. when, whatever you first, like, I think it's Romans 9 and 10, 10 9 and 10, it says, confess with your, confess heart. your heart. And Okay. That is the milk. That is just the very beginning. That is the beginning. Then becomes the teaching. That's the discipleship part. Goes clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I was going to say is, when you're talking about uh, this th living the transformed life, okay, you have to understand, and we've said this time and time again, and it's so very important that you cannot change you. Amen. The character of God is not something that you can produce in yourself, mm -hmm. and that's where people misunderstand and they wind up getting into works yeah okay yeah you can't work this thing it's mm -hmm. not about that god is mm -hmm. the one who works in you mm -hmm. and your role and your responsibility if that is what you desire is mm -hmm. to yield mm -hmm. yield to him and let him have his way because he has and he's given all every one of us who have said yes to the lordship of jesus christ mm -hmm. and i continue to use that phrase Yes, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, where we say, you be in charge of me because I'm about to die. I'm going to give my life over to you so that you can live your life through me. OK, this is what happens when at the point of salvation, when you surrendered and stop being the king on your throne of your life and admit that you can't do it. 
Jesus is more than happy to come in and do it for you. Amen. And so what he does, when he comes, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God that raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus didn't get up on his own. Being God and man, he still needed the Holy Spirit to get up out of that grave because he was sure enough dead. Amen. Okay? We are sure enough dead. Mm -hmm. But the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he's going to quicken us and make us alive spiritually to the things of God. And then he's going to start working on some stuff in our heart. The lying, the anger, the... Mm -hmm. the uh, 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 manipulation and all, all those things that we've learned as humanity, mm -hmm. you know, we use those things to our advantage. They prevent you going to heaven too. But what God wants to do, he wants to help you to, to get rid of those. So in Galatians 5.22, you read about the fruit that you see in a person's life when the Holy Spirit is in charge of that person's life. Mm -hmm. You see patience. You see long-suffering. You don't see them with the quick tongue getting angry at every little thing somebody say. Mm -hmm. You know, they may have been that way, but you begin to notice there's a little change. They don't get, you know, don't get angry quick like they used to before. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is working. He's doing a job. And that's what he comes in us to do, to create the character of Christ in us. We can't do it, but if you yield to the Holy Spirit, he will do it in you. Amen. And something else uh, that I want to make a correction for, I like uh, when the Holy Spirit comes in. And, and remember, brothers and sisters, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, don't be ashamed to keep it to yourself because the word of God, not only for you, okay, but it's for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the brothers and sisters in the, inside of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, I've said many a time that the only thing that uh, 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 giving and offering is for is just for the widows and the children. Well, I got convicted this week. Uh, a couple of brothers uh, pulled me to a side and my wife too. And uh, revealed to them, and, and then the scriptures they went in the book of Acts. The disciples went to the Gentiles, and uh, uh, because uh, Israel, uh, Jerusalem, I think it was, was starving. Okay, and he went to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles uh, they, they collected money from child Paul did, and some other disciples, and took it to the uh, Jerusalem to the Jews. And one thing I, I remember saying in the Bible said. Uh, it was like they owed it to them because the, the word they were getting, if you remember what the Bible says, the word came to the Jews. So the Gentiles received it. So when Paul collected the funds, he felt it wasn't no, uh, uh, they should be giving it to him because they received their gift. Okay, the Holy, you know, the word of God. So it wasn't no thing because they received the word of God. They were willing to help the other brothers in Christ, which were the Jews. Okay, and we had not only uh, uh, women and, and children, but we had men. How the women and children, and I would study saying women and children because the women and children were not being treated uh, properly. And so that's when Stephen came about. They, the disciples then uh, say, well, Stephen, we need, we got work to do over here, but we want you and a couple other men to deal with this issue. And so that's the uh, part that I'll be referring to. But remember again, whenever the Holy Spirit reveals something to you, because you're going to have people, as God uh, uh, leads you, and uh, uh, you have people that's homeless. And even Christ said, you're going to have them with you all the time. And he also said this, when I was hungry, did you feed me? You know, when I, when I, when I was uh, uh, in, in prison, did you come and visit me? You know, there's many things that Christ says, but when you have a person like myself and, and don't know, it's good when he reveals it to you, for I would not be ignorant. You see, so don't let yourself and what past said to you control what the word of God says to you. Always stick to the script. And God who loves you will reveal it to you. Yes. It's a good thing when God reveals it to you. Yes. It's even a better thing to confess it at your mouth yes, because yes. it's about Christ and it ain't about you. Yeah. Thank and you, you know, I really am uh, so grateful to mm -hmm. God for what he's doing uh, in both my husband and our lives as he's. He's the one that's transforming us and making us able mm -hmm. to, to do his will. And so, um, uh, you know, we have uh, things that God may reveal to our, our hearts, like my husband says, but he has come into the knowledge of being able to acknowledge that because there's growth in that. That's what that is. That's growth. Because most men, women too, 
we ain't gonna admit when we got something wrong, you know, because we wanna be seen a certain way in the eyes of folks. But when you come into the kingdom of God, you'll learn the men pleasing and trying to, uh, uh, you know, keeping up appearances for other people, all that goes out the window. So you don't do that. And, and they will watch you grow. And that gives them something to look forward to. There's a story in uh, Corinthians, I think it is, where uh, Aquila and Priscilla had to teach mm -hmm. Apollo because he had a understanding that needed explaining. Mm -hmm. And all they did was just explain it more perfectly mm -hmm. for him so that he can grasp and understand. But we're all in a state of growing, in a state of being taught. We're all disciples. And so the Holy Spirit is going to teach you and you're going to grow from one level of understanding to another. Mm -hmm. So don't despise it. Don't be ashamed mm -hmm. because you're in school. I remember you know, some she and just you're said, learning. Remember she just said, you're 100 correct, baby. We're in school <laughs> and we're learning. And the school is inside every just world out here. But let me tell you something. Don't pass on what she just said. It's real critical. She said, Apollo and Aquila and Priscilla. And Priscilla. That's a husband and a wife. You get that? The man who they taught or, or explained was a man of God mm -hmm. who was taught by Paul. He was one, that's why he was one of the disciples. You see what I'm saying? Paul, and he, he needed help. That's right. So like I'm saying to you, God don't only speak to man. Don't let this religious thing out here shut you down. If that is so, then the Bible, if you believe in the word of God, book of Titus. It actually tells the women to talk to the women. Come on now. Come on, you actually had in the Old Testament, don't you something new, but the Old Testament, our friend Deborah. How about Esther? She told the people, she told the people, look, tell them to pray, tell them to fast. Come on now. So we got this thing about women can't, women can't. That's our perception. We better stick to the script. The more we know the word of God, the more we'll humble ourselves to that word of God, and we'll begin to receive the word of God and then believe the word and become doers of the word of God. Because okay. other than that, what happens is we fall short. We, we miss the blessings. And some, sometimes God was sitting, uh, uh, I think he said, out of mouth of babes. Babes could be a boy or a girl. Ah! So, I mean, we got to learn to begin to uh, uh, listen to the word of God. We must decrease. He must increase. Mm -hmm. My wife would say, we're in school. This is school. Now, because if, you, uh, if you're in the school, the Bible and Revelation say he's going to open the book. And all of the things that we did, even our thoughts, going to come out. The question goes, so this here is a time in which we are to change. And to change it, our hearts, they're talking about heart, your brain up here and stuff. The brain and the heart that Christ is talking about isn't a flesh and blood. We, we, we renewed in Christ Jesus. We're talking about spiritual things. So the changing your heart out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth will speak. If you have a flesh or heart, then you're going to speak those foul, wicked things and mm -hmm. point out and anger and hate and those things that don't have anything to do with Christ. And you might win and hurt somebody's feelings and think you don't bother, don't bother you at all. But let me say this to you. You might get away with it here, but during that time, there's a time we call the second death. Y'all, I'm telling you, I've been reading and studying and listening to the word of God. We might get away with it here and think, well, just dying and that's all this to it. No, it's not. No, it's not. There's a second death. There's a second death, y'all. And that second death, you don't want to be a part of that. No, you don't. You, okay, yeah. so you want to receive Christ now, but you don't have to go to that uh, second death. And then that second death is a total different thing. You know, mm -hmm. Christ is coming back. But as my wife just read, don't be... You know, be at work doing the work, work of God that he's given you to do. If you don't know, get into the fellowship. I am not opposed to churches. Let me get that strictly correct. Thank goodness, because it's the body of Christ. That's the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And we get together to fellowship and buildings, okay? And sometimes people start off in the spirit and go into the flesh. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of different denominations, stuff I'm not against any denomination, nor am I against any uh, non-denominational churches. What I simply say is this, read the word for yourself, but when someone is talking to you, a pastor has a spiritual gift. You have many spiritual gifts, but the fruit of the spirit is what God looks at. He gives you the gift, but what do you do with it? You have many people start off in the spirit and go into the flesh. Many of us do. And a lot of us, it takes time before we realize, it takes myself, it takes time to realize when you're in error. But when you're in error, you know, then repent. 
but, but remember something else. When you're taking time for yourself, remember don't judge somebody else before it's time either. You see, and that's what a lot of us do. We judge the person before it's time because they haven't received the word of God. But God is not like that. Look at the thief on the cross. Amen. You know, but, but what we do, we don't look at Christ. We do it ourselves. So we're going to convict that joker. We're going to, uh, you know, say, we look at him now. And then we're going to say, I don't want to do with him. But God might send you to that facility for you to share that word. And that pastor might receive that word, or that people that might you hear might receive that word and change from their wicked ways or change from their ignorance. Mm -hmm. You know? And then God, with his grace and mercy, you know, through, through the Holy Spirit, then will enlighten them. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and fills the body, which we are, and everybody gets to go, you know, stop drinking milk, get to start eating meat. Mm -hmm. okay. And you also have to remember that. In our humanity, we were flawed all, already. Most people mm -hmm. don't want to admit that, but we are. We are flawed because mm -hmm. we've, we've been separated from our, our maker for so long, our creator, and there's so much that we don't understand. But he wants us to understand. Yes, he does. And then uh, when we come together and fellowshipping with one another, it's just like going to a big family reunion, and you get to see all your cousins and your, mm -hmm. your, your new cousins and your, you know, your uncle and aunts and things like that. It's such a joyous time and a time of refreshing. You get to learn things about people. Well, when God brings his body together in, in, in this fellowship, uh, we have a purpose. We have a purpose when we come together. We're coming together because we want our lives to be sharpened for God. We want to grow in the knowledge of God. We want to be able to uh, share and serve uh, one another. All of these things go on in a household of God. But there's a scripture that I'm going to read for you um, that we keep in our, um, these are our, our Sunday morning uh study sheets that I, I created them so that we can take notes. Amen. But in it, it talks about in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, uh, about how the disciples, uh, when they fellowship together, what went on. And this is what it says in the NIV. Mm -hmm. It says, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn mm -hmm. or a word of instruction, mm -hmm. a revelation, Mm -hmm. a tongue or an interpretation everything must be done so that the church may be built up we are coming together so that the holy spirit can inhabit us as a people mm -hmm. he wants to he wants us to hear from him and so he will use one of us who has that gift of exhortation he will use one of us who may have the gift of tongues and Amen. the interpreter to tell you what God just said. Mm -hmm. He will put a, a hymn or a song on somebody's heart. And when they sing it, you know it came from heaven. Amen. Okay. This Amen. is what happens when you've got genuine people seeking God united together in a fellowship. He shows up. Amen, baby. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm looking here. Uh, let me see if I can get this correct here because I want to, uh, I can't find a, uh, where it's at, but let me, let me do this real fast and I'll tell you exactly what I'm reading from. The, we're talking about, uh, inside of Second Corinthians 9, 13 through 15, the, the Lord, it talks about our ministry, okay? Uh, and, and the hour is us, we got to take the scriptures personal. So what I want to do is kind of read this slowly. And, and wife, if you read it with me, this, mm -hmm. and if you don't mind me interrupting you a little bit mm -hmm. here and there, uh, uh, they'll get a clear understanding. Which version are you? Uh, we're talk I'm doing the uh, New, Living, uh, New Living Translation. Okay. Okay. So uh, if you start off, uh, like I said. Uh, 13. I think it's 13. Yes, dear, please. As a result of your ministry. Now stop right there. Now. In other words, we have a ministry. It's God's ministry. And now, now he's, he's saying as a result of your ministry, as a result of our ministry, that God gives us. Go right ahead. And ministry is a service, God. It's a service. Thank you, wife. They will give glory to God. Who will, as a result of how we live, it's a walk of life, okay, the service. People see us and give glory to God, okay? Mm hmm for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. Let me say the very first part again. For what? For your generosity now, for to them. for our generosity. What, is, what does that mean? How we treat them. 
okay? They're going to give glory to God because we are being obedient to the word and they see it. Go ahead. Please. Okay. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Because you treat them the way you do because God, because inside of you, you treat them with respect, you treat them with love, you gave them the word of God. He's going to pray for you. Okay, that's, that's, this, this is God's word. Go ahead. Thank God for this gift. Mm -hmm. Thank Too God. Wonderful. God, God gave us that gift. For words. And if you don't mind, and like I always say, we Go gotta ahead. have a context mm -hmm. for things because when it's out of context, you really don't know what they're talking ahead, about. Man. In uh Second Corinthians, uh uh Paul was just applauding uh these people and you know getting them prepared mm -hmm. to give. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh earlier my husband meant uh mentioned the tithe mm -hmm. and uh it's uh, Old Testament purpose. Mm -hmm. And here and today, um, he was uh, believing that uh, the tithe and offerings should not go to the man in the pulpit. It should go to the mothers, uh, the mm -hmm. um, fatherless children, and the widow women, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay, which was a part of the ministry of the, part, the, part. Or, uh, the first mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. okay? And we don't see a lot of churches focusing in on that, but, but Paul... Uh, never taught about tithing mm -hmm. to the New Testament church, okay? That's right. Neither did Jesus. Mm -hmm. That was not a part of the, the New Covenant teaching. Mm -hmm. However, he did teach them to give, That's right. okay? That we should have a generous heart mm -hmm. because of what God has done for us. Jesus told his disciple, freely you have received, mm -hmm. now freely give. Amen. This is the attitude uh, of gratitude. For what God has done for you, out of that we give. And you know what? Most of us going to give more than 10%. <laughs> because when you think about the goodness of what God has done for That's you. That's what I'm talking about. 10% uh, ain't, no, no. It don't <laughs> come from that place. It don't come from a law that says you got to give your tithe or God's going to curse you and stuff. No, no, no. no. That was the law. That was the work. Okay, we're not under works and law. We're under grace and truth. So what we want to do is, it says here in uh, Second Corinthians, he's uh, starting at verse six, mm -hmm. and um, I'm sorry, we got to go further than that. He says um, in verse, starting in verse one, collection of Christian, collection, the collection for those Christians that were suffering in Jerusalem mm -hmm. because they were being denied normal services and everything else because of their faith. And you know, that's going to come down our pike soon. But anyway, he <laughs> says, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving to the believers in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help. And I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many other Macedonian believers to start giving not tithing. Mm -hmm. But I am sending these brothers to be sure you really are ready. As I have been telling them that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention mm -hmm. your own embarrassment. Mm -hmm. If some Macedonian believers came with mm -hmm. me and yeah. found that you weren't ready after all, mm -hmm. I told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me mm -hmm. to make sure the gift you promised is ready. Mm -hmm. But I want to be, I want it to be a willing gift. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God says he loves a, what kind of giver? A cheerful, a cheerful giver. giver. Mm -hmm. Paul is telling these people, I want to receive, hopefully we can receive a willing gift, mm -hmm. not one that's given grudgingly. Mm -hmm. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a seed, only a few seeds, will get a small crop. Mm -hmm. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Mm -hmm. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Mm -hmm. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Mm -hmm. Did Amen. you hear that? Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Mm -hmm. And God will generously provide all that you need, mm -hmm. then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others, mm -hmm. as the scripture said. Mm -hmm. So when we have come into this new covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. he brings us a new and living way to live, Amen. not under the law, compelled 
to give a tithe or a 10% mm -hmm. of legal uh, uh, ramifications that went, went out when Jesus was raised from Amen. the grave. Amen. But here you see that we are givers by nature now. Mm -hmm. That's a part of who we are. Mm -hmm. When anybody and God touches our heart to give, Give generously. Mm -hmm. Be a blessing to somebody. Amen. And if you ain't got it, don't give it. Don't give it. Oh, if man. you mm -hmm. if you know that you owe your mortgage and a pastor or anybody comes up to you and says, give up your uh give up your, 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 your mortgage so Bill that money. so that so that you can uh Children's play money. God. God is not that kind of person Children's because money. that that end that means that the agreement that you made in good faith to your to your landlord. Now you're reneging on it. Hmm. You you actually are saying, uh, I made a covenant with you to pay you this much. Well, this month, uh, just forget the covenant. Hmm. I'm just gonna break that with you because I want to I want to give this over here. And if you believe that God would actually uh, uh, allow something like that, where you make a covenant with someone hmm. and then you break it hmm. because a man told you you're supposed to break it, hmm. then no, learn learn to ask God about things. Okay, I inquire of Him. He will answer you. So we're going to start getting into our word right yeah, now. One thing, one more thing. There is a other, one more thing about giving. You had, uh, 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 what's the name, the, the, the two that gave money and was lying about the money, this stuff. So Ananias we, and Sapphira. Yeah, you got to watch that too. I uh, forget what the scripture that's at. It's an Acts. An Acts mm -hmm. also. But you got to watch that stuff because those, they lie. See, when you give it unto God, you make sure that the giving, like, like my wife just reading, stay in that world, stay in that frame of mind. You don't have to worry about how much you give. If you give, when you get, but you remember who you give, you're giving it unto the Lord. That's right. Okay. When somebody takes Lord money and spending on cars, houses, stuff, that's not your business. Okay. Because you're giving unto the Lord. What they do with it, would a man rob God? How do you rob him? You okay? With so, your tithes and offerings. With your tithes and offerings. What the law says. But what, we're not under We're not under the law. Okay. So we are going to get into Brother Zach right now and uh, enjoy and get your pencil and paper out for you can have questions. And uh, whatever the Lord uh, relate, you know, uh, reveals to you, or we can, so you can share with us also. Amen. Hold on for a second. We turn today to continue our study on all that Jesus taught. We have been looking at how to fulfill the command of Jesus in his great commission in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, which I have called the neglected half of the great commission. First part of the great commission is Mark 16, 15. The second part is here, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. All that Jesus commanded must be taught to disciples all over the world in every nation. We come now to the last part of Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 29. It's the concluding paragraph of the Sermon on the Mount. Here Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, can be compared to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. It's not that he didn't hear the words of Jesus. He heard it. He's referring to Christians who go to church, read the Bible. They hear, and these words of mine specifically refer to the Sermon on the Mount. This is the conclusion to what began in Matthew 5 verse 3. These words of mine, and does them. He is like the man who's built his house on a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, burst against that house, but it did not fall. But the one who hears these words of mine, that means he reads the Sermon on the Mount, he believes it, he believes it as the word of Jesus. He goes to church and listens to the preaching, reads the Bible, but he does not do it. He understands it, he's excited about it, but he doesn't do it. He has built his house upon sand. Now the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, burst against that house and it fell and great was its fall. So what is the difference between these two? 
The children sing a chorus, build your house on the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And then it goes on to say, so build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So many people think that if I have accepted Christ as my savior, I built my house on the rock. Now there's a sense in which Christ is our foundation. He's the only foundation. But here, if you read carefully, what did Jesus say is the proof that a man has built his house on the rock? It is that he obeys. Not that he's just said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please come into my heart and forgive my sins. What if a man says that? And there are multitudes of Christians who have said those words, who imagine themselves to be born again, but who don't care one bit for the commands of Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. They don't seek to overcome anger. They don't seek to overcome sexual lust. They're not careful about speaking the truth and many, many other things. They don't love their enemies, but they have said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. They're living in a world of deception. They're like the man who hears these words and does not do them. Maybe he understands them. Maybe he's excited about them. You know, in our previous study, we were looking at people who said, Lord, Lord, in Matthew 7, 21 and 22. When he says, Lord, it means his intellect is right. He's understood the truth. When he says, Lord, Lord, it means his emotions is right. And he's excited about it. But his will is wrong. Our personal, human personality consists of three parts. Our soul, intellect, emotions, and will. Mind, emotions, and will. And we may have understood the truth in our mind and be excited in our emotions about it. Lord and Lord, Lord. But if we don't yield our will to do the will of God, we're deceiving ourselves. It's the same here. What is the sand? The wise man is the man who penetrated all the way through the sand and hit rock. This becomes clear when you read the parallel passage in Luke chapter 6. There he said, the wise man is Luke 6, 48, the one who dug deep and hit rock and there laid his foundation on the rock. In other words, he dug through the sand. They were both building in the same area. The surface was sand. The foolish man built on the sand. The wise man dug through the sand till he hit rock and blasted the rock and laid his foundation there. What is the sand? The sand is our intellectual understanding of God's word. The sand is our emotional excitement about God's word. You can intellectually understand everything. He who hears these words of mine, understands them, is excited about them, calls me Lord, calls me Lord, Lord. He's still on sand. When his will is blasted, when he yields his will and says, Lord, I will not do my will, but your will. When the self will is shattered and he dies on that cross where he says no to his will and does God's will, that's the moment he hits rock. So that's what he's saying here. One who hears these words, excited about these words and does them, not just hears and is excited. In other words, it's the will, it's the yielding of the will that finally plants our house on the rock. It's the yielding of the will that goes beyond saying, Lord, Lord. In the Old Testament tabernacle, the soul was represented by the holy place. The outer court represented the body and the spirit of man is represented by the most holy place and between the most holy place and the holy place, there was a thick veil which was closed in the Old Testament times, which was torn when Jesus died on the cross. What did that tearing of that veil symbolize when Jesus died on the cross? Hebrews chapter 10 explains it to us by saying in Hebrews 10, 20, Jesus inaugurated a new and living way into the most holy place through the veil and that symbolized his flesh. And flesh means self-will. Jesus did not have sin in him when he came to earth. He was born as the Gabriel angel Gabriel said as a holy thing. But he did have a self-will. Otherwise he couldn't be a man like us. And that's what the Bible calls flesh. When it says Jesus came in the flesh, 
it means he came with a will of his own. He said that very clearly himself in John 6, 38. I came from heaven to deny my own will. He had a will of his own that had to be denied. Why should it be denied? Because it was contrary to his father's will. To deny my own will and to do the will of my father. And that's what we see in Gethsemane. Not my will, but thine be done. It is a classic example of uh, he didn't want to drink the cup. So he struggled for one hour and said, okay, father, if you want me to drink the cup, I'll do it. He denied his own will and did the father's will. But that was true not only in Gethsemane, it was true all through his life. In temptation, the essence of temptation is to do your own will and not to do the will of God. In Genesis 3, God's will was don't eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve wanted to eat of it. It made her mouth water. The devil told her it'll make you wise. And she did her own will. That was the origin of sin. Doing your own will and denying God's will. Salvation came when Jesus did the opposite. He denied his will and did God's will. It's so simple as that. And so we see it's the will that's important. Not it's a question of not how much you understand God's word or how excited you are in God's word. You can feel so spiritual when you're emotionally thrilled singing those songs on Sunday morning in your church service, which you call praise and worship. It's not worship at all. Worship is when you deny your own will. That's only emotional praise or thanksgiving. It's not worship. Worship comes when we deny our own will. When Abraham offered Isaac on the altar, giving up his own will, he said, I'm worshiping God. You read Genesis 22. The first time the word worship comes in the Bible. That is worship. Where you deny your own will and it costs you something. Like it cost Abraham something to put Isaac on the altar. That is worship. That is the denial of one's will, which opens the way into the most holy place. And so when the veil was rent, when Jesus died on the cross and he said, it's finished. What he was saying was, I have faced the entire range of temptations, Hebrews 4.15, that any human being can ever face. Not all the circumstances, but all the temptations. And he said no to his own will in every one of those thousands or millions of instances in 33 and a half years. He never did his own will. Or in other words, he never sinned. In other words, he said no to that will of his which was like the flesh the veil and so the veil was rent so the veil being rent was symbolic of the fact that Jesus in his entire life when he died on the cross had never done his own will and opened what he calls a new and living way what is this new and living way the veil is a way not a door a way a way means something that we have to walk on consistently is the way of denying our own will and doing the Father's will so that we can live in the Father's presence forever, in whose presence there is fullness of joy, Psalm 1611, at whose right hand there are pleasures forevermore, Psalm 1611. Why do people seek the pleasures of the earth? Because they haven't seen the eternal pleasures in the Father's presence. Why are people discouraged and gloomy and uh, in bad moods? Because they haven't enjoyed the fullness of joy there is in the father's presence because they don't deny their own will the devil has fooled even christians by saying you'll be happy when you do your own will it's a lie you're miserable when you do your own will jesus was constantly happy always rejoicing because he did his father's will so this is the point here everyone who hears these words of mine and does them if he doesn't do them he's still on sand however much he may have understood them However much he may be able to take a Bible study on the Sermon on the Mount, however much he may be excited about it. What are the things we have to do? If we have a quick look through of what we have covered in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, let's have a look. The nine right attitudes. Seeking for poverty of spirit, a constant sense of our own need, mourning for our sin, and mourning that we are not more Christ-like, meek so that we don't fight for our rights, Matthew 5 verse 6, hungering and thirsting, not for money or healing, but for righteousness, merciful to others no matter what 
wrong they have done to us, forgiving them. Verse 8, pure in heart, not just pure on the outside, but pure in heart, wanting only God and not anything else. A good conscience means I'm free from sin. Pure in heart means more than freedom from sin. I desire nothing but God. I only want God, nothing on earth other than God. Peacemakers always pursuing after peace with all people, believers and unbelievers, willing to stand up for righteousness, verse 10, even if it means persecution, suffering, loss. Unashamed to confess Christ, even if it brings loss and persecution, verse 11. These are the nine right attitudes. And then he speaks about the importance of being salt, the salt of the earth, the light of the world in verses 13 and 14. And then he goes on to speak about the nine wrong attitudes that we can have, which is, first of all, anger. Man who hears these words, what are these words? Anger can finally lead you to hell, Matthew 5, 22. He hears these words and fears anger and wants to turn away and get rid of anger completely from his life, Matthew 5, 22. And who takes sexually sinful ways of thinking seriously and wants to get rid of it, not 90%, but 100% from his life because he sees that can also take him to hell. Verse 29 and 30. These are serious. A man who hears these words and does them. Lord, I want to have a radical attitude in this area of sexual way of thinking, in, in the area of pornography and internet pornography and everything else. I want to cut it off completely. I, to be as radical as pulling out my eye and cutting off my hand. I want to take sin as more serious than losing my hand. How many of you believe that sexual sin, even in the thoughts, is more serious than losing your right hand or losing your right eye? The wise man does that. If you don't have that attitude to sin, I say, you're not a wise person. You're not building your house on the rock. Many people take this so casually. And then the third wrong attitude is in relation to lying. Is lying. To be absolutely truthful in our heart. And number four, revenge is another wrong attitude. Verse 38 to 42 of Matthew 5. And then the fifth wrong attitude is hatred. To eliminate all hatred from my life. The sixth wrong attitude is seeking the honor of men. Matthew 6 verses 1 to 18. The wise man seeks to be completely free from seeking the honor of men. Just like he seeks to love all his enemies. He wants to be completely free from the honor of men. And the seventh wrong attitude is the love of money. The wise man doesn't just hear about it. He wants to be completely free from the love of money. It's not a question, as I said, of whether you're wealthy or poor. Poor people love money and wealthy people love money. And it's possible to be poor and free from the love of money. It's possible to be wealthy and free from the love of money. The 1 Timothy 6 says, Charge those who are rich not to give up all their riches, but to share what they have with others. And to provide for the need of other poor believers. The eighth wrong attitude is anxiety. Matthew 6, verse 25 to 34. It's a evidence of a lack of faith in a loving father when we are anxious as to what's going to happen to us in the future, when we can't trust that God will provide all our need, he who feeds the birds and cares for the flowers, that he won't care for his children. Jesus said, even the hairs on your head are numbered. You are of more value than many sparrows. It's a great insult when a person believes that his heavenly father will not provide for him. When we have to go and ask people for money, like a lot of preachers do and a lot of people when they go and borrow from people, they are saying, I'm not content with what God has given me or God's let me down. Can you imagine Jesus going to somebody in the days when he was preaching and say, can you give me some money because I'm a bit hard up. My heavenly father has let me down. It's so ridiculous to even think of that. But that's how it is when many preachers and many people when they go begging for money. They, a lot of Christian preachers just 
dignified beggars. What about your heavenly father? Isn't he the one who rules the universe? He didn't care for you? If the richest man in the world, if his son came to you asking for money, what would you say to him? Hey, are you the son of the richest man in the world? Why are you asking me? Probably your father has disinherited you, right? That's why you're hard up. And so when a Christian goes begging for money from other people, what he's saying is, my heavenly father has disinherited me. I'm no longer his child. He's given up on me. And that's why I'm hard up. I'm like the prodigal son, far away from the father's house. And I have to eat what the pigs are eating. I have to go around begging for money. Every Christian who has to who has to go around begging for money is like the prodigal son, far from his father's house. Can you imagine a, a son who is in his father's house having to beg for money? Completely out of the question. If you have to get into debt and you have to beg and borrow, it is one indication that you are far away from the father's house. And if you're anxious and worried about where your provision will come from, you're not in the father's house. Anyone who's in the father's house is not anxious. The prodigal son was anxious not when he was sitting at the father's table. He was anxious when he was far away. So anxiety is a wrong attitude. And the ninth wrong attitude is judging others. The Bible says in James chapter 4, there is only one judge. This is such a simple truth. Yet, we need to hear it again and again. James 4 verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. If you speak against a brother or judge's brother, you're speaking against the law. The law says you must love your brother as yourself. But you speak against him, judge him, you're judging the law itself, the law of God. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer, but a judge of it. Then it says in verse 12, there is only one lawgiver and judge. And this is an important word because lawgiver and judge are put together here. When the Bible says in Matthew 7 verse 1, do not judge. He's saying there is only one lawgiver and judge. Remember that. A judge has a right to lay down the law. You, you and I don't have any right to lay down a law. And so when I see Christians making rules for other Christians, Christian preachers making rules for other Christians which are not found in scripture, they have become lawgivers. This is a mark of a legalist. A legalist lays down rules for other people which are not found in scripture. Now to teach the principles that Jesus lived by and to explain to people how that principle applies in a particular situation is a different thing. But to lay down a law for other people in an area where the Bible doesn't lay down a law but gives us a guideline, you're becoming a lawgiver. And there are many, many areas and lawgivers also judge other people when the other people don't keep the laws which they have made. Are you a lawgiver? Then you're taking the throne of God. You're sitting like God on his throne. We have no right to make laws for other people except what is written in scripture. And if somebody does not obey that law, we have no right to judge him. God is his judge. Unless God has appointed us as a sub-judge, as it were, in a sphere where God has given us responsibility, like a father over his children, like an elder over his local church, and like an employer over his employees in that sphere. Outside of that, we're not called a judge. It's so important. Now, if a man hears all these things and does not do them, he is building his house on sand. One day, the flood will come and everything will collapse. Now, both houses may look alike and on the surface, the superstructure may look alike, and but the wise man is a man who has paid a price which is invisible. The most important part of a house is its foundation. It's teaching us that the most important part of your life is that part which other people cannot see. Mm -hmm. Every house has got two parts. What can be seen above the surface of the ground, what cannot be seen. And the most important part is what is beneath the ground. So in all these areas that we were just considering about the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you hear these words and you don't do them, you're like a person who's got no foundation underneath. In your inner life, you're not obeying these things that are written here. But your superstructure looks okay because you're serving God, you're going to church, you're singing, 
in the church meetings and doing many things that Christians do. And you look like a Christian in all your activities. But one day, God is going to test not the superstructure, but the foundation. What did the flood come and test? The flood didn't come and test what material the superstructure was made of or how attractive the superstructure was. The point of this is the flood came and tested the foundation. And you'll find in the final day when Christ comes again, that what is going to be tested is not what other people thought about our life, the outward part of our Christian life, but that part which nobody could see, like we read in 1 Corinthians 4 or 5, which we considered earlier, the hidden part, the part under the ground, the foundation which nobody knew. Perhaps your wife or your husband even don't know what your inner life is like. So the Sermon on the Mount concludes with the foundation is more important than the superstructure. And you must be willing to pay a price to go through the sand, to dynamite and blast the rock. The man who's not willing to pay a price for his inner hidden life is a foolish man. Many people don't want to pay a price to walk that inner walk with God. They are foolish. When Jesus finished these statements, it says here, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching because he was teaching them as one having authority. You know, the great need today in the pulpits in Christendom is for spiritual authority. Jesus had lived what he had preached. And one paraphrase says it was obvious that he was living every word that he was preaching. That is how we get spiritual authority. When we have preachers who live every word that they are preaching, they have spiritual authority. That's the type of authority we need in our pulpits and that is sadly lacking because people want to have a cheap, easy way to minister God's word. Go and study in some Bible school, get a degree and preach. It costs far more than that. In our hidden life, we have to pay a price of yielding our will at every one of these points that Jesus brings out in the Sermon on the Mount and to obey them. But if we do that, great will be our reward and great will be the long-term, permanent, eternal results of our ministry. May it be so in all of our lives. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. As we conclude this study, Heavenly Father, we pray that we shall take your word seriously. Lord Jesus, help us not only to hear your word, not only to be excited about it, not only to say to you, Lord, Lord, but to do, to yield our will, to deny our self-will, and to do your will every single day of our lives till we see you face to face so that one day we can hear from you those wonderful words. Well done, good and faithful yeah. servant. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Powerful word again. Was that Rich powerful? Stuff. Was that powerful? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, 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 the clearness. I thank the Lord for our Brother Zach and the Lord has given him as a spiritual gift. And that's why I was saying earlier, uh, we got a brother who uh, teaches the word to us. Uh, uh, that we go and search out different um, subject matters, but it, it's, it's, it's just an honor when God calls you and then feeds you. You know, for he can now uh, do a work in us so we can be able to share uh, share his gospel and spread the gospel. Amen. Because this our time, and I was talking to the Lord this morning, and he was saying he's preparing us, you know, uh, equipping us with his word for when these times come, we will be uh, uh, sharing the gospel of God, maybe in someone else's uh, church or a gathering, or the Lord has us to do a uh, uh, an event for him that we will be equipped with the truth and that the truth will not be set 
uh, us even free, but uh, believers and people who are searching him uh, will set them free, but they will want to willingly serve the Lord. Uh, yeah. uh, we won't make rules, uh, as the Lord has told us not to do through his word, but to give his principles that the people would uh, have the opportunity to accept or, or deny, not, not their will, but to humble themselves to do his will. Amen. And uh, once, once you learn who God is, I do believe more people will come to him uh, willingly. And uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it's not going to shake up some church because you, you, know, you hear the word itself because he's going to start in his own house first. But I say to you, don't let us judge the thing before it's time. But don't let us judge those people as the word says. Right. Pray for them. Yes. You know, and so that's what we are, and that's what we're to do. And um, it's just a great, great word today. Thank you. It is. It is a great word. And um, it really gets you to thinking. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes we don't quite comprehend or understand things mm -hmm. at least from the aspect uh, aspect of our knowledge and because we don't know everything you know uh we should be more willing to yield and say i don't know a thing or Amen. let me pray about a thing you know or, or going to god about the answers because we don't know we just don't know mm -hmm. and so you can't hold a, a person accountable for what they don't know even if they make you think they don't know mm -hmm. but you don't know what they don't know that's right. so that's why god says stop judging stuff i remember when um you know i had a very poor image of my husband primarily because of the way he was treating me mm -hmm. this is before he he came into the knowledge of the truth but and um made jesus his lord but you know i really had a uh a bad perspective about who he was mm -hmm. and God had to correct me and this is the the beauty of a loving father he will correct those that he loves he's not gonna have you walking around you know spouting out lies and things like that he's gonna help you to come into another truth but this part of of my journey I had not learned this truth about judging so uh, and I tell about it in my book, uh, Life's Uncertain Journey, uh, mm -hmm. during this time period when I was suffering so much, uh, you know, waiting for God to do what he promised he was going to do in my husband's life. Mm -hmm. And this um, little roach crawled, went across the floor, and I got a revelation from it, and it was divine. God gave me this revelation. And that was, just as I was watching, this roach would go across the floor and i could see where it was going to wind up and i knew what was going to happen because i was going to whack it when he got over <laughs> to the outside of the uh, you know to the open area however god was showing me that nadine i am god who sits high and i look low i see everything mm -hmm. from the end to the beginning now you nadine can't see all that but i see it so from where i am if I told you that I'm going to save your husband, you need to believe that I'm, I'm not a liar. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. It ain't going to be in your time. It's going to be in my time. Mm -hmm. So stop judging things before it's time. Because while I'm using my tongue co condemning him, I got an answer for that. He, just because I don't see it don't mean that, that when God says that thou who judges, and I think it's Isaiah 54, with, you know, that your your judgment you're going to be condemned by the words that you say about somebody that person that you see as a heathen today god already sees him saved you don't see him saved because you can you don't have that that purview you you can't see the end from the beginning god knew my husband was already saved even though it hadn't didn't happen on december 12 2000 you know 1988 you know it may not happen to 2018 but god doesn't judge him based on 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 where he was because god knows where he's going so i say all that to say um that we're ignorant just take it for granted that there's a lot that we don't know mm -hmm. paul even admitted that he killed christians he was a jewish who went around killing christians and god jesus had to knock him off his horse and say wait a minute hold up bro you know you're doing this against me the very one that you say i don't exist i am he you know so but God brought him to an understanding and then he knew. So when God is going to bring you to a time of understanding, then you'll know. But until then, keep this thing in check. Okay. And stop using your lips against things that you don't understand and wait on God. He'll reveal it in time. 
And remember something, once you have uh, God, the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, you build those things to you, repent. Okay, sometimes you yes. can't go back to people because they're gone mm -hmm. in your life, but in your spirit, man, repent from that. You know, yeah. uh, go to God with that and uh, he'll forgive you, yes. okay? Yes. But you, you don't keep it in and say, well, it's too late. No, nah. no, nah. then you're going to be judged on that later on down the road. But if you listen to it, the word says repent, okay? Repent from that. If that person dead and gone, that's still the, the sin. Remember what uh, my wife just said? When Paul was killing those people, Christ didn't say you're killing the people. He said you're sinning against me. Okay, those people were doing, you know, who was killing was doing God's work. But he told Paul, you are sinning against me. So remember that when we come against those Christians, we talk about them and stuff of that nature, and those persons, like whether they're dead or alive, yeah. we're mm -hmm. sinning against God. That's right. So repent from that, and God will forgive you. But uh, as my wife was talking, I did think uh, what she was saying, and uh, matter of fact, when Zach was talking too, back in the days when I was in the world, uh, I was uh, knowledgeable of the word because my wife during that time, but she was in study. She was actually in study for a good 15 years. She actually became a pastor in those days, an ordained pastor. And she was study under uh, two or three different pastors, you know, so for the last like 15 years, and I heard the word. Remember they said walking on sand? Well, that was me. I had a knowledge of the word, but I, it, you know, I didn't go down to the rock. I was legalist, and I, I tried to use the same words that I was hearing that she, she was giving against her. Same thing Satan did. And that's who was my master at the time, you know, and he was leading me to do those type of things and say, well, hey, you know, including getting high and those type of things, womanizing, all those things you can, it's in the Bible where the Bible says don't do it. Matter of fact, he did it from uh, uh, Moses' day, Ten Commandments, but then Christ came and said, well, look, that was the outside, but the inside. You see, those things got to change. You see, I was walking the outside, but not the inside. And when the inside takes place, it's a change of heart. You see, so many of us have built our foundations on the sand and the knowledge but not the spirit, you see? And that's two different things. The, the, the knowledge is the law, okay? And that law will get you killed. But the spirit of the law is the grace, mercy, kindness, long-suffering, those type of things. And that was, thank the, thank the Lord, that's what he gave my wife, okay? And during her journey, that uncertain journey, what I was going to happen to me. But the doubt came, man, just like all of us have doubt. When, Lord, when, Lord? Even in the book of Revelation, those people up under the stairs, at God then, they're talking to God. And that's God. When, Lord, when, Lord, you're going to straighten them jokers out. We ask the same question down here. When, Lord. But again, we go back to the beginning when we first start talking. Well, it's not the business when I'm coming back. It's not the business when I'm straightening things out. You do the work I told you to do. Humble yourself. Do my will. See, that's what we're to do. But instead of that, when we got, we're pointing fingers, looking at things, and we're judging things. Even if we don't say something, we know who we do, what we're doing. We can't fool God. So just like when we, He's talking, we're talking about the part of our giving and stuff like that. We got, the, the, and the, I mean, Bible actually tells you about it. When the end days, you're going to have those people come into the pulpit to tickle your ear. Those people are going to uh, uh, be giving a false gospel. They're going to add to it and take some away from it. And these type of uh, pastors, so even when we see them, you're to pray for them. We're not to condemn. Uh, uh, my man David said to, uh, uh, in, in the Bible, when Saul was acting up, he said, that's God's doing it, man. God put that man in place. Who are we? So we got to begin to think the spiritual. And, and David only said it through the umption of the Holy Spirit when was in it, the new was talking to him because that's when he wouldn't speak against God's man. You see what I'm saying? So we got to learn to humble ourselves. Those of us who walk on sand for a long time, the thing is you got the knowledge on the outside. We got the laws. We got to slay the law. We got to let the knowledge that God has given us now uh, go to our hearts. We got it in our heads, book knowledge. We can bring up this and that. But we got to now begin to let it in our heart and change our hearts. We got to let that hard heart that says, well, no, this is not go. We got to let that go. Not our will. Whenever we say no, that's our will. We're not coming against the person who we're talking about. We're coming against God. That's what Paul did, came against God. What he was doing, his actions were against God. Our actions are against God. That's why he said, not I will be done, but his will be done. So therefore, if we want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, walk this walk, we can't tell other people it's first. We got to do it first. Be doers of the word. And then as we're talking to people, 
it's easier for them to see us. They'll see us and our walk, and then we'll be able to testify to them, and then they'll have an example. We're God's example. We're his light down here. We're the example he left. We are his disciples. We are. So therefore, if we're going to be his disciples, then be it. Mm -hmm. I, we have brothers and sisters who we uh, uh, in church who we go to the facility, we know them. But do you really know them? And do you know your wife? Does your wife know the husband? The Lord just told us then, a lot of those things in our hearts because they're dark. How deep is that darkness? You know? But if we repent, if we, whenever you repent, you get freedom. You truly, truly get freedom. The Lord will remove it because once he removes it from you, place his word in its place. Well, it can't come back and search you with seven more different, you know, worse demons than the one they got uh, uh, removed from you. And that simply means study the word of God. You know, just be around people of like kind. You, if your wife is not saved or your husband is not saved, don't point out their faults. Pray for them. You know, you, you're concerned. And I'm not saying that, you know, you're to stay into relationships that are violent or anything. No, I'm not. I'm just saying that you then uh, under the law, but not the law, but under uh, man's law, today the same thing applied then. Was Caesar given to Caesar? Was God given to God? If a person is putting their hands on you improperly, then that's why he, the law has put in place is the legal system. But that person can be removed. Use that legal system. But I say to you, if, if it's a thing of the heart, which is, you know, when you're hurt and, you know, and that stuff like that, and the hurt is because you have anger in your heart against someone, that is hurting you. You got to go to God with it. God will heal that heart. God was the one who you want. He'll actually correct the person actually who, you know, put their hands on you, be wrong, whether it be a woman or man. He actually does those things healing also. But the thing is, what I'm getting to is this. Everything we got to do God's will. That is the key thing. In every situation, God has already provided a way. Jesus is our example. If you study the word, look up a subject matter. When you look up a subject matter, you'll find that God has the answer for you. But if you go to man, then you'll have a book knowledge. It's like I read the Bible, but I have a book knowledge, but not the spiritual reason, uh, understanding or how it can apply to my life. If you go to man, you not saying the man uh, uh, not going to tell you God's word, but God's word, you must receive it. Like the word says, you must, uh, Jesus said it this first. He said, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Okay? That eating, that's the word of God. When you eat that word of God, it becomes part of you. It actually becomes a living part of you. And then it, you're transformed. The old man decreased and the new man increased. The blood is the shedding for the sins. See, well, so when you, and now, and I tell a lot of people this now uh, recently, we know Jesus as a forgiver, but do you know him as a savior? Jesus, God so loved the world, he sent Jesus to save the world. One thing we use it for, well, Lord, be my healer. Lord, forgive me for doing this, forgive me for doing it after you do it. When you know you're going to do it, you're going to start asking, premeditate the sin. That's what it is. But then you say, well, uh, God is good, God, he'll forgive us. Yes, he will, but believe me, when you continue to do this, should I stay, I'm saved, but should I continue to sin? Should I continue? God forbid. God forbid. And you know, too, um, as my husband was telling about um, Jesus Christ as our Savior, you know, I'm so, uh, he was telling me yesterday that a new uh, Avengers movie just came out. Mm -hmm. And you know, the whole theory that these superhero people are mm -hmm. out there to save the world and stuff like that, uh, which is a pseudo concept of, what Jesus Christ has already accomplished for us. If there ever was a superhero, his name is definitely Jesus. Come on, baby. And so what he did when he came to uh, deliver us from the uh, um, bondage of the sin that we were in that we didn't even know we were in, mm -hmm. okay? And the culprit who got us there in the first place, mm -hmm. Satan, was defeated, mm -hmm. okay? So he, he had... Uh, a role to play in our demise. Jesus had the greater role to play in our redemption. Amen. And you know what? He did exactly what the Father sent him to do. Mm -hmm. So, just as you see Superman on TV flying through there saving people, he do not go in each one of those people's houses and help them <laughs> live their lives. You see, understand what I'm saying? It doesn't go that way. But Jesus can. Amen. He can go into every one of our homes mm -hmm. and minister to us in our day-to-day -day living by his Holy Spirit. Yep. That's what the Holy Spirit's purpose is. Mm -hmm. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's the one that's going to help us to live through 
this mangled world that we're, we're, we're assigned to for the moment, okay? And we're assigned to this world for the moment to be a representation of God's children in the earthly realm, Amen. okay? And that's what God wants us to happen. He wants to show to Satan and his minions, oh, I got, I got my own children. Mm -hmm. And this is what they do, okay? And so what winds up happening is the Holy Spirit enables us to do it because God knows we can't do it. He Amen. knows it, so he gives us the ability. But um, there's a scripture that I wanted to read from Psalm 37. And uh, when I was uh, trusting God in, in, in my walk, um, dealing with some of the things that I had to endure, waiting for my husband's transformation, um, it was hard. And I tell you, it was hard. And, you know, we often counsel, and I do too counsel women that you know you need to get your instructions from god mm -hmm. don't read my story and try to do what you saw god do with me mm -hmm. it don't work that way all of us are different i have a different temperament i have a different way of thinking and god deals with me based on the way he created me god's going to deal with you based on the way he created you mm -hmm. but the only thing that's constant and never changes it's his word. Mm -hmm. He's not going to adjust that for you. He's not going to adjust it for me. Mm -hmm. However, he's going to give you the proper segment that you need for what's going on right now. And Psalm 37, this kept me. And I think the, the reason it was able to do so much in my life was because I believed God. I believe his word. I really do. I believe it literally. Okay. And so when I read scriptures, they came alive to me. So when he told me in Psalm 37, uh, fret not thyself because of evildoers, you know, people who are always, you know, backbiting, talking about you, you know, uh, mistreating you, all that kind of stuff. God said, no, you don't worry about them. Because that, that's, that, they're, I used to tell my husband, you're a job for Jesus. Because hmm. I can't do nothing with you. You can't true. do nothing with these people. That's true. You know, you can talk to your blue in the face. You however, however, God has a way of getting their attention yeah. that is lasting and eternal. Mm -hmm. So you commend them to God. Don't hate them because of the way they are. They just haven't come into the knowledge of the truth yet. Mm -hmm. Or they just may be a child of Satan. Mm -hmm. And Jesus took care of that too. Yes, he, he gave did. you authority over them. Mm -hmm. So look, this is what God says. I'm sorry, Psalm 37, and I'm reading in uh, verse 16. So and I'm in the, Psalm 37. Oh, yes. Hold on. Verse starting at verse 16. Psalms. Psalms. And so um, I'm, I'm reading from the, the New Living Translation. Psalms of Solomon. Not Psalms of Solomon. Psalm. Right? Mm -hmm. 37. 37? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And which verse? 16. Okay. I had it on one. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for waiting. Here's what it says. It says, it is better to be godly and have little than to be evil and rich. Mm. So what that spoke to me is as much as hard as I was working three jobs at a time, trying to hold on to the property, to the house that God had given us. And believe me, it was, it was not an easy task. I had four children. And I had to work three jobs so that we wouldn't get thrown out of our place. But I didn't pursue the riches of men. I just knew I needed to work to be able to feed my children and to keep our household. But uh, when, when my strength ran out and I couldn't do that any longer, mm. God stepped in. But listen to this. For the strength of the weak, wicked will be shattered. But the Lord takes care of the godly. Hmm. When I could no longer fend for myself in trying to maintain my household, God stepped in. Do you know that God had a homeless man bringing food to me and my children? Yeah. Do you understand yeah. that? I mean, who, who would think of such a thing? But he did it. When, I, uh, when, uh, when the uh, foreclosures came on the house and said, you know, they were going to foreclose on our house and, you know, they're at the front door with the notice. When I went to my mailbox that day, there was more than enough money in that mailbox to cover, uh, to keep the foreclosure from happening. 
And I don't mean something I was expecting. I had no idea what God had in plan for me, but you know, from my husband's social security, but it was enough to do what we needed to do. And this is what I mean. God takes care of his children. I would have never imagined that. Day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. Mm. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Mm. Oh, and they're coming, beloved. Mm. Even in famine, they will have more than enough. Mm. But the wicked gonna die. Mm. The Lord's enemies are like flowers in a the field. They'll disappear like smoke. Mm. The wicked borrow and they don't even repay you. Mm. But the godly are generous givers. That's my point. Mm. This is who we are. We are generous givers, not out of compelled, uh, con relentless, you need to give, you need to give all that. No, no, no. We have a generous spirit like our father mm. and we love to give. Amen. Okay. But we don't give under compulsion. And he goes on to say the, the Lord, those the Lord blesses will possess the land. Mm but those he's cursed are going to die. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail in their lives. You see, no part of your life is menial to God. He wants to be involved in everything in your life. He says, listen, though they stumble, they will never fall. Hmm. For the Lord holds them by the hand. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Do you understand that the devil wants to trip you up? He told Jesus. Listen, to Jesus. do you know he wants to trip you up so that you can fall away? Second Thessalonians talk about the age in which we live, when there's going to be a great falling away, that people who once believe are going to just step away from their beliefs and embrace the doctrine of this world. It's happening right now before our eyes. You read it. Amen. You see? But the godly God says, they're not going to fall. Because he's going to uphold them with his mighty right hand. Amen. And that's what he does. Once I was young, David says, and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. Hmm. The godly always give generous loans to others. And their children are a blessing. Amen. So this is the heritage for the godly. The godly, okay, not the fakers. I'm talking about the godly. Mm. God has already provided for you a hope. He's already given you uh, the, the scenario of what he has provided for you as his children. Mm. And that you can take to the bank. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, don't stop reading that, uh, uh, that verse, that, that, that scripture right there, because if you go a little further down, uh, you're going to find out what the Lord does. Uh, he says, he tells us, turn from evil and do good. And you will live in the land forever. <laughs> okay, so there's so many blessings that just yeah. relates to the, a little, these are nuggets, y'all. This mm -hmm. Most people will take this one scripture, which is a nugget, and make it, uh, you know, uh, the Bible. But the Bible is uh, convinced of so many things. What he said then, he was talking way back then in David days. David was telling people what Lord did for him, but he'd do the same for you. Yes, he's okay? no respecter of person. You know, or time. Mm -hmm. See, I go out and do like we have to do with time and stuff like that. But God has put us here for a reason. You have knowledge now that he did it for someone. You have knowledge now of who he is. You have knowledge now that he's a forgiver. Yes. Yes. You have knowledge now that he says, no, be a cheerful giver. You have knowledge now when you do those things, that your children will be blessed also. You see, you have knowledge now that says, well, stop doing evil. Stop yeah. doing good. So even if you was doing it, you stop. Not do good. That's it's, right. it's so simple, you know. You ain't got to go through all this uh, training and counseling. Stop it. You can do it through the Holy Spirit who God, Lord says this, when I go, and I got to go, because then you, I'm going to send you the comforter. The comforter and it, it, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and comforter are one. But check this out. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the counselor. And they both are God. 
is God in three different forms. Mm -hmm. And let me just put this Go in there, on, baby. because I know sometimes people hear things and they run with it. Uh, my husband does not mean that training and counseling is bad. No. Because that's not that's not what he's saying. It's just not the necessary when you got God. Right. Because he got it all. Everything you need is found in him. And so when you are struggling and you're going through, you know, if you if you feel that, you know, you need to, uh, the Bible says in a multitude of counselors, wisdom. Mm -hmm. But you got the counselor of counselors. That's right. In the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And when you've acquainted yourself with this word, You'll find answers to your issues right there, mm -hmm. right already written out for you. And I have uh, encouraged you, if you to, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. That's they right. had a kind of relationship like no other. And I would encourage you to read the stories of David, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, Chronicles, Psalms, and learn and just look at the relationship that they had. That's the kind of relation God want to have with you. And I'm going to tell you this, y'all. The word tells you, even from the Old Testament to today, they'll never leave you. No. You see, so if you think that because you're not so bad and, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just too late for you, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. They'll go through the thief on the cross. They were guilty and they admitted they were guilty. And Christ knew it already. But the one who repented on the cross, the, the man wasn't baptized. Neither of them were. But he received Christ. He knew Christ wasn't asked Christ to forgive him. Do it as yourself, you are. You don't know what the next second Amen. holds for you. Just yield. You know, right now, ask the Lord to come into your life. You know, and just, you know, but you got to believe it in your heart. He'll yeah. do it, what he says he's going to do. And that he loves you. Yes, yes. And he, you see, you're here for a reason, for his testimony. And you're going through these things. But once you've gone through, that's why I tell him, don't forget, go back and get your brother. You see what I'm saying? That's your mm -hmm. testimony. And your testimony brings other people to Christ. That's right. Because they, they know you. The people who know you know who you were. It's like me and my wife. They know who you were. You read it in her book, Life on Certain Journey. But so they know I, who we were, especially those ones who, you know, during those time periods, you know, the almost 50 plus years, you know, 40 plus years, they know us, where we came from. Yeah. And nobody thought. We've seen marriages that were supposed to be so blessed and anointed that they're not even there anymore. You know, not saying that they were on the sand, but we're saying that those people who were saying, those were married, saying that we wouldn't last, are separated. You see, but God, and we know those people still, yet we still love them, and they see our marriage, and they see where we're at, and they know that God is real, because they know only God could do what he's done. And not only you is see? God real, but they know that we made a choice. Yes. There, there's a choice that had to be made in our lives. You know, and and when you have made that choice, God takes care of everything else. Yes. And what he has done for us, he desires to do for others. And that is not to say that we have arrived. Don't get that wrong. Mm -mm. Okay. We are yet being transformed every single day. That's there are things that we thought we knew mm -hmm. that were truth that we're discovering what the truth at all. Mm -hmm. But that is okay because right now we are in Christ. And Christ is going to see that we get everything we need as we avail ourselves. So our desire, we're just vessels. Mm -hmm. We've said yes to the Lord. He'll do the same thing for you. Yeah. If you surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, he will be the Lord of your life. And he's going to take over. He's going to transform you because he needs you. He needs your hands, your feet, your eyes, your mouth. And like he was in the world, 1 John 4, 17, like Jesus was in the world, that's what we're supposed to be. Amen. But we know that right now, the way that we are, it ain't going to happen. But if you yield and you go ahead on and die, let him have his way with you. You'll see. He'll use you. Well, brothers and sisters, we know the time is short, but I want to remind you, do not forget the fellowship with Christ. Do yeah. not forget to... Uh, have the communion with Christ. That's between yeah. you and he. Right. You know, okay? It's between you and him. You don't have to have wine. You have a little juice or a little bread or whatever have you. Back in the days when Christ did it, they say he broke the bread. That bread that he broke because it was real bitter. Okay? So it's not necessary that you have good rich crackers or good this and that. It's not necessary that you have uh, wine juice to do. But remember who you're doing it unto. So when you do this, you ask the Lord, Lord, this is between me and you. I'm asking you, Lord, because I'm remembering you. 
at this time and what you did for me. And you take that bread and you break it and you say, Lord, I thank you, the Father Heaven, for, uh, for your healing. And I thank you, Lord, for putting your, uh, you know, going to the cross for me and dying for my sins. And uh, I, I thank you, the Father Heaven, that you've made a way out of nowhere. And I do believe, the Father Heaven, that you're coming back to me one day, the Father Heaven. And when you come back, Lord, you're coming back to get me. Uh, I repent for my sins. I actually go to come to my life and anything in me. It is not pleasing to you, Father. I actually remove as far as your east is from your west. And then you drink the blood. You know, the blood is the, what he took to the Father for our sins. That is, the, uh, when my wife talks sometimes about the Old Testament, she talks about the blood on the door. Well, this is the, uh, the, the Passover. The Passover uh, meant that uh, the blood had to be shed, okay? And the shed, that this time when Christ shed his blood, it was shed for our sins. See, that blood, oh, the doors back in those days, protected those people from, uh, from death. So you have the opportunity now to, to surrender and ask the Lord, say, Lord, uh, as I drink this, uh, this, this offering, I'm doing it, <coughs> excuse me, God, I'm doing it in your memory. So Father in heaven, I thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord. I thank you to Father in heaven that uh, you showed up as you always do, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that everything we have is yours, that you're allowing us to use have it. Have your way, Lord. We ask you, Father in heaven, that you bless those who, uh, who hear this word. We ask you, the Father in heaven, that uh, you let you use us mightily to go out and do your word, Lord, and uh, to bring other people to you uh, by our testimonies. We ask you, the Father in heaven, that you bless uh, your word, Lord. Bless uh, those people searching for you, Lord. Open the door and put people uh, in their path, Lord, that, that will lead them to you, Lord. Your Father in heaven, I ask you to break the bonds of bondage, Lord, a bondage of the law that people are walking in today, Lord. Yes. And your Father in heaven, that they would realize, Lord, that you are forgiving God, your Father in heaven. I ask you, the Father, touch your heart about the giving. Let your Father be a cheerful giver, not a legalistic giver. But dear Father, let them remember, Lord, that when they give, they're giving unto you, Lord. Thank you. I thank you, dear Father, for the families today, Lord. I ask you, Lord, to bless the marriages. There's so many things that's going on. You know them all, Father in heaven. You know the sick, dear Father. I ask you to bless them. Heal them, dear Father heaven. I thank you, dear Father, heaven, for healing my mom, dear Father, for we can hear from her. And I thank you, dear Father, heaven, that even in her state of mind, that you're still there, she's focused on you. I thank you for my sister and cousin, dear Father, heaven, Ella Reed. I thank you for my cousin and sister, uh, Denise. I thank you, dear Father, for those uh, widows out here, mothers of single mothers, Lord, and orphans, dear Father, children. I thank you, dear Father, heaven, that you've already prepared uh, a place for them, Lord, and that your Father, you send people like thank me you. and my wife to minister to them. So, Lord, help us to do your will. Not mm -hmm. I'll be done, but your will be done. Use the ministry, the gift that you've given us, Lord, to, to advance your kingdom. And we give all things to you, Lord, our home, our finance, our transportation, of ourselves, Lord, and everything we have, Lord, we give unto you. And we ask you, Father Heaven, to have your way with us, now and forever. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye, everyone. Have a blessed day. Have a blessed day.